Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Thursday, April 11th, 2023-24. Oh my gosh, I thought we just went back in time here. Today we're going to be talking about the state of Montana and a 2024 Senate race that is so, so incredibly important here, and how the Republican nominee here seems to be in a very interesting predicament as he gets embroiled in scandals that are of a variety of different degrees. I think these are things that are pretty tame going this early into an election, though, uh, but still are important things to consider and important things to understand that this is the start of a trend that began a bit uh, six, seven months ago in 2023. Uh, Tim Sheehy, who at first uh, got an article published in the Daily Beast, we found here about a lawsuit that he was facing while he was in flight school. Now, this was something that didn't end up being as much of a big deal as the Daily Beast ended up trying to make it to be, largely too. I think a lot of people saw this as an unfair piece to Tim Sheehy. Of course, it's something that is entirely up for debate. The point here, though, is that this was the beginning of something that we have now started to be more and more of a trend. Over the past two weeks alone, two stories have been published, one about Tim Sheehy lying about the origin of a bullet wound in his arm wound. We'll talk about that in just a moment, but also another one just a day before about $77 million lost in 2023 from his company here. And while you might be thinking, okay, you know, just because his company didn't do so well, why is this news? It comes at a time where Tim Sheehy simply cannot afford any type of negative press. And so, so far, for the past months now, we've only seen negative press. What I'm more interested, though, is this focus on this veterans group here slamming Tim Sheehy's evolving gunshot story. The TLDR on this is that he said that he received you know, a bullet wound, essentially insinuating that it came from someone who was an enemy, comb enemy combatant, something that had happened while he was deployed, whatever it might be. You know, This story was one that had changed a variety of different times, but the real story of it was that he had told someone that this was an accident that she had shot himself, and ultimately this was not the result of any type of conflict, any type of battle. Regardless, though, it was a very, very public ordeal because now he had to apologize for it and said that he ultimately did lie to a group of supporters that he was speaking to when he said that he was shot in the arm when he was deployed. And so, you know, this is something that I think is just the start and continuation even of this trend that we first saw with this article about the lawsuit. Then it was about his business. And then it was about this bullet wound that goes to show that outsider candidates in some instances just really aren't super strong. I think Tim Sheehy at face value was a very, very different type of candidate than Republicans had ever run against John Tester in the state of Montana. When you take a look at years past, even in 2012, when he was running for re-election here, he was running against someone who had been pretty well known across the state and also just, quite frankly, was much more of a politician than Tim Sheehy is. In 2018, Matt Rosendale, also very much more of a politician, had served uh, in elected office before and was running for this as a step up to be the Montana senator. And he ultimately lost and decided to run for Congress and ran and became the representative from Montana at large, then Montana's second district after they had two congressional districts. But ultimately, you know, John Tester had not been up against a candidate like, uh, like Tim Sheehy in quite some time now. And so Republicans thought that by bringing in an outsider here, they would be able to make major moves, right? They would be able to turn this race into something that was very similar to Donald Trump's victory back in 2016, a political outsider candidate who could take on the establishment, in that case being John Tester, and who could represent them better because he wasn't a politician, he wasn't this career candidate, whatever it might be. He was someone who was by and for the people. And so with that, they took a number of risks. Their first risk being that they weren't running a candidate like Matt Rosendale, who had been tried and tested as an incumbent or tried and tested as a politician. In fact, in 2024, Matt Rosendale, who lost the Senate election in 2018, decided he wanted to run for this election again. And ultimately, he did. But the Republican Party took major problem with this. In no reality do we you know, ever see that repeat candidates for congressional races or presidential races even, Donald Trump being maybe an exception and Grover Cleveland being the only one in American history uh, and Richard Nixon. But you, know, you look at this and you say, this is a race where you have a candidate coming back and Republicans know. Conventional wisdom tells us these candidates don't win. They don't have a pathway to move forward because voters rejected them and remember that they rejected them. They remember that Matt Rosendale ran for Senate in 2018 and that the scandals and the problems and the issues that these voters had with his campaign then are just as relevant today. And so Republicans did every single thing they could to ensure that Tim Sheehy, who now describes himself as, uh, you know, a Navy SEAL, somebody who is a veteran, he tries to be much more personable to the average person than someone like Matt Rosendale, who is a U.S. representative here. And they did that by really building out a character for him. Because at the very beginning, Matt Rosendale was very much going to win this primary. He was set to win it with 64% of the vote in June of 2023. Then came August, around 52% of the vote. The point was that he was set. 
He was up by 30 points in a minimum, up by 54 in other polls, and ultimately just had this upper hand, and no one even thought that there would be a way to challenge or break him down. But Matt Rosendale decided that he wasn't going to announce his bid for the Senate this early on. Unlike many other candidates in the race, he decided that he was going to hold out and say his decision right around the declaration period. Well, as the months went on, Republicans took advantage of that opportunity with Matt Rosendale really being unable to directly respond to any comments about a potential Senate bid, any conversations around it, any interview requests. All of it had to be under the radar for whatever reason. I don't know what it was because he ultimately did decide to run for Senate here. But it gave Tim Sheehy the visibility and the ultimate ability to win this Senate primary, which he is very much on track to do so. But he overtook Matt Rosendale back in October of 2023. And around this point was when we started to realize that Rosendale was not going to be the nominee, that Tim Sheehy had somehow turned around this primary and Republicans were enthusiastic. They were enthusiastic because at this point in time, they had a candidate who did not have the same issues that were raised in 2018, did not have this name ID that was seen as very negative when paired with John Tester on the same exact ballot. And they thought by bringing in this outsider, they would be welcoming in someone who could bring in a larger electoral victory or even an electoral victory that Matt Rosendale simply would not have been able to deliver. But what I think we are now realizing I think we've known this for a while, but Republicans often like to take this risk here. When you bring in outsider candidates, people like, you know, Tim Sheehy, or even go so far as to say somebody like George Santos, who didn't have electoral experience before running for Congress, you invite in a type of candidate who does not have the same formal vetting, the same formal background, the same, you know, non-scandal, uh, you know, background that you need to run for positions like this, such high profile positions. He didn't have any of that. And he didn't have any of that because all of these things surfaced because he ran for Senate. People didn't know about his background because he wasn't as visible as a figure uh, of a figure, right? He was someone who, sure, had been running a business, had been well known amongst Republicans as somebody who was being questioned, and they certainly did their own internal vet. Don't get me wrong on that part. But what I do take problem with is the fact that so much of this was swept maybe under the radar or was entirely you know, ignored, right? This is something that I think you find Republicans facing a lot of problems with, and most recently in 2022, with people like Herschel Walker, when cases related to his wife populated. People like Blake Masters, where issues related to Peter Thiel and other business dealings have come up as an issue. Dr. Oz, just as someone who was a very big TV personality, you'd think being in the spotlight so much that all of your baggage would come up, evidently not, right? And you look across this country, and candidates like these often, despite being outsiders, and I think largely because they're outsiders, end up with a lot of political baggage that cannot be predicted earlier out in advance. And so I think that is really the fundamental problem here, that when you bring in people who aren't media trained, you bring in people who supposedly speak their mind and don't take intentional political calculation when it comes down to what they're saying at every single moment, what they're tweeting at every single moment, what they have said in the past, and archiving and protecting that digital footprint, that overall press footprint, or that financial footprint, whatever it might be, candidates who are tried and tested, people like Matt Rosendale have learned to do that in a way that Tim Sheehy simply has been unable to. And so this already comes in at a time where Tim Sheehy is losing to, Matt, to John Tester when it comes down to statewide polls. The Senate polls here show John Tester with a lead of 5.5% on average. Might I add, on the presidential side of things, Donald Trump is an average lead here of roughly 19 to 21 percentage points. And so the state of Montana is far from being this very much, you know, solid conservative state on the Senate level. Tim Sheehy, despite being the Republican nominee that Republicans really, really tried to prop up, has not been demolishing John Tester in the polls like he was expected to. I think the big problem with Matt Rosendale was that Republicans had already written off him as somebody who was never going to win. There was no chance. There was no viability for a campaign like that one. But for Tim Sheehy, they had hope, but honestly, incorrectly so. I think looking at the polls, looking at where we are, scandal after scandal populating is not where you want to be heading full force into the general election season. I do fundamentally believe that John Tester is one of the best Democrats in the Senate right now when it comes down to electability and being able to evade very solid conservative waves, ones that you might see in 2024 in a state like Montana, where ultimately John Tester could prevail. And Montana is at a unique point of importance, in fact, might be the closest race of this election season here, given that it has a Democratic incumbent in a state that Donald Trump is largely expected to win by potentially 20 points or more. Montana is a red state at heart, but not on the Senate level because John Tester is good with constituent services, because John Tester is approved of because of his bipartisan record. John Tester has a lot of support here because he's the one Democrat in Montana 
who doesn't seem to be aligned with Chuck Schumer or Nancy Pelosi. And to those voters there, that is a very good thing. And so John Tester in this state is going to really give Republicans a run for their money here. Tim Sheehy is going to be spending, and Republicans have already allocated over $50 million in this state, but close to $100 to $200 million to win this Senate race here in a state with three electoral votes, a population as small as Vermont's. I mean, you are talking about a very, very small state here that's going to be receiving tens of millions of dollars in funds because Montana is that important. Montana is that girl. And so when you look at a state like this, and when you look at how competitive a lot of other states are too, Montana makes them look so much smaller in comparison. This is going to be the race that is going to define the outcome of the U.S. Senate alongside the state of Ohio. Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, more likely than not, if I was to call it today, I would say it goes blue. Arizona and Nevada, if I was to call it today, I would say it goes blue. And for the rest of the states like Minnesota, New Mexico, Virginia, and Maine really aren't going to be competitive, and so I'd call them as blue. But Montana and Ohio are very close. They are going to be the closest races of this election cycle. But chances are, given the Republican nominee for Senate in Ohio, Sherrod Brown will probably win. It'll be very close. It'll be, you know, an extremely tight race where we probably won't know the result for a day or two after the election. But Ohio, I think, is going to go blue, which means it does come down to the state of Montana. Because Republicans are able to win in Montana the way they did in North Dakota in 2018, in Missouri in 2018, in Indiana in 2018, in Florida even in 2018. It's a whole ballgame. Democrats lose control of the U.S. Senate, and Republicans win it back for the first time since 2020. The state of West Virginia, automatic flip to the GOP, so we're not even really going to touch that at all. But looking at Montana, this is certainly an extremely, extremely important state. Because Democrats and Republicans are relying on it to vote for their respective parties, to ensure a majority for their respective parties. Montana will be so exceptionally important, so exceptionally close, that you really should start tracking it today, in the same way that we are. But the Republican Party needed a slam dunk type of candidate to win this race. And while I do think that they have the opportunity to win, and while this could be turned into a slam dunk campaign depending on what happens between now and November, it certainly is not off to a good start. Tim Sheehy is a Republican who does not have much electoral experience and yet seems to have as many electoral scandals as a traditional Republican politician in the state of Montana. And that's a problem. Because when you have people like this, who haven't been on a ballot before, haven't been tried and tested incumbents, adored by their constituents, high approvals, all the necessary components that you do see in Republican challengers who often do unseat Democratic incumbents. People like Kevin Kramer, the incumbent U.S. House rep from North Dakota, defeated Heidi Heitkamp. He became a U.S. senator and ultimately was someone that voters liked and admired. And so he was able to take down a popular incumbent. That is not the case with Tim Sheehy. He's too much of an outsider, and I think it does serve to his detriment here because voters simply are now starting to see these scandals for the first time. And Democrats are starting to unearth things and do opposition research and really unpack this Montana Senate race in a way that we have not seen before. Matt Rosendale, I think, honestly, could have been, in some circumstance, a better pick for the GOP. Even though he had lost in an election before, Everything has been under a very, very tight lens here since the beginning of his term in the House, since he ran for Senate in 2018, and Democrats and Republicans should know what they're working with. And I think if Republicans believe that it's more worth taking the risk on people like Tim Sheehy, who are not media trained, who don't know how to talk about these things to the average voter, don't know how to talk to voters or donors or whatever it might be, you end up with scandals like this one, where they lie about their military service or they end up being sued over something that you didn't even know was a problem that happened when they were, you know, so exceptionally young, or not so exceptionally young, uh, you know, so recent, 2019, something that doesn't show up in an initial vet, and yet the Republican Party you know, finds us to be the guy that they want, and then ultimately the world comes crashing down when these scandals start to break. I think there's plenty of reasons to believe that Tim Sheehy should not have been the nominee for U.S. Senate. The question I have, though, is who would people had instead? I genuinely don't know. I think the results here do show that Tim Sheehy is not this star-studded, you know, amazing candidate that everybody tried to make him out to be. He's not an A-lister. If anything, he's a B or even a C-list candidate at most. Matt Rosendale might have already started off from that point, but it's talking about the evil you know versus the evil you don't. And I think looking at the state of Montana, looking at the Senate race here currently, Republicans are not blowing it out of the water. They're not putting it in a really strong position for them to maintain control of all of these other states while winning control of the U.S. Senate. This map is so lopsided in favor of the GOP, and if Republicans cannot get Montana, it will be a complete and utter embarrassment. 
But based on where they are right now, I don't imagine that it will be super easy to go from this to winning an election this November. Not to mention that Democrats are likely sitting on continuous opposition research that they have dug up. They're probably not releasing it all together because a lot of it I think they're waiting to use as a September and October surprise. But if this stuff is coming out now, chances are there's a lot more. And Democrats are going to keep digging until they find more and more and more that can be weaponized and used against Tim Sheehy as a Republican nominee in the same way that Republicans have tried to do against Democrats. But John Tester is simply immune. Being in the Senate since 2006, he has been under constant surveillance. And yet, voters can't seem to find a reason to vote against him. Fundamentally, Montana is at a point where should these scandals continue, John Tester will be on a pathway for an easy re-election. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2024 Senate election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all later today.